on today and who still reside here in Los Angeles. We pay our respects and thank them for allowing us to be here today. To find the ancestral keepers of the land you are on, you can go to native-land.ca. Today, you will engage with a collective of trans and non-binary storytellers, each sharing their own unique vision on liberation through their work, their knowledge, and their experiences. Opening the summit, we have a keynote address from filmmaker and activist River Gallo, a screening of Ryan Baker and Nathan Blue's visual love letter to the trans community titled, A Place That Is New, a sneak peek discussion with the team behind the upcoming four-part docu-series, Trans in Trumpland, a musical performance from the queer, non-binary, transcontinental multimedia collective, Waste Woman, and culminating with an artist panel on the power of imagination and storytelling as liberation featuring Scott Turner Schofield, Nava Mao, Nathan Blue, Bambi Salcedo, Cher Avery, and Blossom C. Brown. My curatorial vision for the summit was inspired by Janaya Khan's piece on living beyond gender binaries and the power of activism. In it, they write, the power of imagination has literally shaped history. Someone imagined shackles on black wrists and enough people believed it to make it true. Someone imagined borders and enough people believed it to make it true. Someone imagined binaries and enough people believed it to make it true. I first heard those words spoken at a Black Lives Matter protest in LA a few months ago. Their words lingered with me. When I was offered the opportunity to create this program, their words Im immediately came to the surface of my mind. In this moment of great social and cultural transformation, I wanted to create a program that could serve as a moment of reflection on the theme of liberation for trans and non-binary people. It is not a guide to liberation, it is an offering. It is the beginning of a conversation that I admit needs more intersectional voices, but it is a conversation that is needed nonetheless. One that centers trans, non-binary and intersex people to reflect on our collective liberation without the intrusion of cis voices. This is for us, by us. For me, liberation is the ability to imagine freely and this summit is a manifestation of just that. So today, I encourage you to listen and reflect. Liberation can take on many forms, and I hope you are all inspired by today's guests to imagine what that might be for you. Now, with great pleasure, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, River Gallo, a GLAAD award-winning Salvadoran American filmmaker, actor, writer, model, and intersex activist, born and raised in New Jersey. Their short film, Pony Boy, which they wrote, directed, and acted in, is the first narrative film created by and starring an out intersex person in the history of cinema. It premiered at the 2019 Tribeca Film Festival. River was one of the faces of the 2019 NYC Pride campaign and received the Rising Star Award at the 2019 GLAAD Media Awards. They were named one of the most exciting queer people to follow by Out Magazine, made Paper Magazine's list of 100 people taking over 2019, and were on the cover of UK's magazine, Hunger. Recently, they starred in an episode of Hulu's Love, Victor, and are currently developing Pony Boy into a full-length feature film. Please join me in welcoming River Gallo. And with that said, please enjoy the program. Thank you for being here.
Hello, everybody, and welcome to Outfest's Trans and Non-Binary Summit of 2020. Um, I just want to start off by saying that this has been a really intense week um, from the horrific police shooting of Jacob Blake and the killing of two innocent protesters by Kyle Rittenhouse in Wisconsin, followed by the celebration of Martha P. Johnson's 75th birthday to then the sudden death of Chadwick Boseman last night. It's been a lot. Um, my heart goes out to everyone who is experiencing grief and mourning and is trying to make sense of all this loss. And uh, just know that we, I and Alphys are holding space for all of you. Um, so I'm gonna be real with y'all. Um, when Kieran asked me to do this keynote, I was like, me? Um, because in their email, uh, they said that I would be following in the footsteps of Yance Ford and Zachary Drucker and Andrew. We cool? Okay, I think so. I think we're good. Okay, so in their email, they said that I would be following in the footsteps of Yance Ford and Zachary Drucker and Jocelyn Ross and just, you know, just incredible trans people. And I asked myself, who am I to give the speech? Because, you know, in many ways, I'm still out here hustling like many independent filmmakers and artists, knocking down on doors to get my work made. And it's been emotionally and psychologically challenging, especially during a global pandemic and in the midst of a racial and societal uprising. Um, however, in the midst of this dialogue and questioning who I was to give the speech, it hit me that this voice is not mine, uh, nor it is one that I chose, that these voices and thoughts of doubts were given to me through years of cultural and systemic oppression. Now, all humans experience internalized fears and doubts. However, we as artists, as filmmakers, as actors and screenwriters who identify as trans, non-binary, intersex, and or people of color, our experience is embedded with a simmering layer of fear for our safety, for our fear of belonging in the world. Um, and this often turns to an, un an unconscious resistance to our own success and a fear of realizing our full creative potential because for most of us, for all of us really, we have lived most of our lives consuming media made by and for white cis hetero men. You know, 96% of film directors are men. 76% 70 of all writers are men. 81% um, of all board members in Hollywood are men and 96% of all executives are white. Um, and this is not, you know, subtle propaganda. This is, you know, real. And it, it's with the goal of maintaining this agenda that cis, hetero, white men are the status quo and the illusion that their lives and existences and their points of view matter more than ours. And we're told that this is Hollywood. However, so is this. So is Outfest. So is what we're doing here today. This is also Hollywood. We are also to tell that have the power to liberate ourselves and our community through the reimagining and re-envisioning of narratives that the world has yet to see because we are telling them now our way and our own terms. You know, liberation is such a beautiful theme to explore in this trans and non-binary summit of 2020. Um, today, I am speaking to you as a proud Latinx intersex non-binary hermaphrodite. And this transition, my journey of liberating my gender and my identity was a roller coaster ride, as I'm sure much of your experiences have been as well. Um, what's interesting about my journey, specifically about coming out as intersex, and it was it was actually very much intertwined with my beginning of breaking into the film and TV landscape. Um, so when I was 12, uh, for the first time, doctors told me that I was born without testicles. And very soon after, um, I was put on testosterone in order to go through puberty. And then at 16, I had an unconsented, medically unnecessary cosmetic plastic surgery um, in order to put prosthetic testicles into my scrotum. 
um, so that my genitals would look like a cisgendered man. Um, and for years, I didn't tell anybody about this. I kept it a complete secret. Um, and if you were close enough to me as I came out as gay and then as queer, you know, I would tell, you know, the people in my chosen family. Um, but it was always under the framework that it was a medical abnormality. Um, it wasn't until making my short film Pony Boy that I decided for the first time that I wanted to share this part of myself in my art. So I decided to do some research while writing the script and I discovered that the condition I was born with was actually part of the intersex umbrella. And it was shocking to me because it took 27 years for me to discover this crucial part of my sex and gender identity. And, you know, it took the collective power of my community of collaborators, my um, co-director, Shade Kakin Joseph, my producer, Seven Graham and Kristen Laffey and um, Stephen Fry and Emma Thompson, who all helped make Pony Boy possible to help champion the story, but also champion my coming out and make me realize that my film and my coming out weren't just niche queer stories. They were human stories worthy of being told in a narrative format, worthy of being told to the world. Um, and coming out as intersex and then coming out as non-binary became very public experiences for me. And because it was coupled with the making of my film and sharing this film at festivals and speaking about it with the press, and it was wild and in some ways still is. Um, because when I was 12, I thought that I would take this secret to the grave with me, um, being intersex, being born without testicles. Um, and 15 years later now, I made it my life purpose to make intersex art, to speak out about intersex rights and the injustices of intersex people. Um, and this was only made possible through the reimagining of my body and what my body meant to me and the reframing of the narrative of my body from seeing my body as a defected medical object that needed normalization and, and needed to be kept in shadows to the liberation that my body is a unique expression of the vast gender spectrum um, that transcends the fallacy that is the gender binary. Um, healing this narrative of my body was only made possible by creating Pony Boy about my experience. And in doing so, so many other people, many for the first time, learned about both the struggles and the triumphs of what it means to be intersex. Um, and in, in turn, it, it liberated them to varying degrees from the story that we have been programmed with that gender exists on a binary. You know, speaking about being intersex is still very new for me and for society. I mean, this is the first time Outfest has ever had an intersex keynote speaker. And there is virtually zero intersex representation in film and television. And on some days, this is very difficult. You know, it's a difficult pill to swallow to, you know, know that I'm one of very few people in the, in the landscape um, reliving the trauma of the surgeries, the invasive doctor's visits, the removal of my agency. And often I reflect back at how when I was 12 years old, I already had these imprisoning beliefs about my body, about how, you know, I carried this shame and this fear that if I ever shared the truth about myself, I would be endangering myself and endangering my safety. And lately I'm realizing that again, that was the voice that this, Whenever that comes up, that's the voice of the oppressor and it cuts deep. And as trans and non-binary and intersex artists, we have been programmed to fear our bodies, our own existences and fear our own stories. This is because we pose a threat to the old world order and we cannot hide the fact that this programming has been propagated by the media we have consumed. Putting aside the atrocities of legislation that don't cover the rights of trans and non-binary and intersex people of color, if we are just to look at the media itself, if you guys haven't seen the documentary Disclosure, right after this summit is over, head over to Netflix and please watch it because it is eye-opening and astounding to see how media has reduced our lived experiences to mockery, to trauma, and further perpetuating hate and discrimination. And the fact is our trauma and our history will never disappear. The even more painful reality is that it's still happening. 
the murders of trans people, specifically black trans people, the non-consensual surgeries of intersex infants and children, the denial of our basic rights and access to resources, it's still all happening. As trans and non-binary creatives, it is our responsibility to hold space for these tragedies in our community, at the same time, create work to shift the narrative, to ferociously and to lovingly create art that can make the climate feel different. And it's up to us as cultural makers to take that responsibility, not as a burden, but to understand it as an opportunity to find new ways to express our collective and individual memories and experiences. You know, one of my favorite, favorite episodes of Pose is in season two when the girls all go to the Hamptons for the weekend. And it's the one where the lecturer gives that like read to that white woman at the country club. And it's just, to me, one of the most iconic moments in television history. But that episode to me was so beautiful because you saw these beautiful trans women of color happy at the beach on a road trip singing in vogue. And that's revolutionary. As trans and non-binary creatives, we need to work at doing just that, providing new, providing something new in our stories, providing some kind of hope that because, because we need to provide some kind of hope because trans and non-binary intersex joy are radical. And that's what we need to be right now. We need to be radical. How are your films helping create the trans, helping trans and non-binary and the intersex community move beyond the current narratives being told about us? Are your films perpetuating the same tropes that we have been subjected and relegated to because it feels safe to do so? Or are you taking a risk and allowing yourself to dream, to see beyond what has been handed to us and tell the story that's actually burning in your heart to tell? You know, we have been inherited a philosophy and these minds that want to seek order through binary categories, male and female, good and bad, etc. And as creatives, we must examine how that binary thinking also plays out into our artistic process in very insidious ways. You know, sometimes when I'm writing something, I find myself going into a place of, will this script be sellable? Will this pilot be a hit? Will this get into festivals? And often I have to catch myself and ground myself back to the real reason why I create, which is for the liberation of our community. So often we're waiting for the email to come back for that meeting that will open the doors to get greenlit, to get the development deal. But the real development deal is not the one that the people in the high castle are gonna give you. The real development deal is the one with yourself. Um, how are you developing yourself? How are you caring for yourself? How are you investing in yourself, the movie that is your life, the pilot series that is your legacy to leave behind on this earth? How is your work being of service, supporting other trans, non-binary, and intersex artists in our community? How is your work contributing to the unfoldment of your highest potential that will ultimately yield the greatest expression of joy, love, and liberation for all? It's imperative now for our work to be rooted in social justice in some form, in some level. And that is not to say that everything needs to be a PSA or based on your real experience, or you, know, you can't make something that's you know, whatever you wanna make, but that is to say that your work must have must be saying something, it must have an intentionality. Our work needs to be heard and our voices need to penetrate and alter the value systems around us. As trans and non-binary and intersex people, we have the peculiar experience that for most of our lives, our identity is asserted by who we aren't. We have to constantly reinforce our sense of who we are consciously and actively, and that's exhausting and that takes work. You know, in many ways, our bodies and our identities are like these puzzles that we take apart and put back together and we're constantly revisiting and trying to figure out. And often our bodies can feel like a ball and chain, but at the same time, they're also the compass that points to the way to liberation. You know, people fear us because of our bravery, because 
of our audacity, our audacity to exist in our truth. And that makes us scared to feel inside of our own bodies. However, it's our bodies that hold a sacred power and truth that all humans are in a constant state of transition. And we are the embodiment of change. Trans, non-binary, intersex people, we are the avatars for transcendence of freedom for all of humanity. You know, we are living through a very critical moment in our time. We are living in a portal when one world is collapsing and a new world is being built simultaneously. And the only antidote to the voice of the oppressor that plagues our minds is the voice of creation, is the voice of our creative selves, of our artistic selves, the part of us that wants nothing more but to give and receive love through the expression and creation of art. The part of us that wants to generate work that fosters community in order to lift ourselves and the people around us up. You know, the systems in place, capitalism, patriarchy, binary thinking, they are all about to collapse right in front of us. And as artists working in film and TV, we need to be asking ourselves amidst this destruction and this collapse, what can we build? What do we want the future to look like? And better yet, what do we want the future to feel like? I'd like to believe that the future is one where we recognize that we are all a unified and interdependent family of beings. It's one where we recognize, embrace, and celebrate that the success, healing, and liberation of one person is the success, healing, and liberation of all of us. You know, we're in the business of telling stories, not just for commerce, not just to pay our bills, to support our children, to, you know, buy homes for our rent. We're in the business of transcending the stories that have been given to us to imagine a world beyond in order to change people's thoughts so that we can break these long-standing spells that we've been under. We must ex accept the responsibility that we create art to change culture. Because by changing culture, we change people's perspectives. And by changing people's perspectives, we change policies and legislation, which inevitably changes the distribution and access of resources. We must embrace that the depth of cultural power that we have as trans and non-binary and intersex artists is incredible. That our stories, our films, our TV shows in and of themselves our acts of resistance, our acts of, revol of revolution and liberation. Literally, white cis men could never, they could never do what we can do. You, as an individual artist, are so powerful. And collectively, as a community, as a family of trans, non-binary, and intersex, and artists of color, we are unstoppable. So thank you so much. Congratulations to all the filmmakers at Outfest 2020. Um, Black Lives Matter, Black Trans Lives Matter, defund the police, abolish ICE, and I hope that you guys enjoy the rest of the Trans and Non-Binary Summit. Thank you so much. I'm the director of the film, A Place That Is New. Thank you so much to Outfest for selecting this film to be part of the Trans Summit this year. So this film is about me and Nathan Blue and us coming together to write a visual love letter to trans people. Nathan texted me saying, I really wanna make a film with you and I don't think we're supposed to know what it looks like. Um, on the day of production. He sent me a couple sketches of what he was looking for. We talked about it um, over the phone of like, here's the general message we're trying to say. Um, but I think it's, we're supposed to be a little bit experimental with production, that it's supposed to be discovered and built on trust. For trans people, um, liberation starts with yourself. And what I mean by that is 
in order for you to come out as a trans person, you have to undo what's what other people were expecting you to be um, on multiple different levels, not even just with gender, but like where your life was going. This film is really just accumulation of that and also kind of a thank you to, to other trans people who led the way of, um, I wasn't able to see myself until I saw another person doing what I realized I wanted. Thank you so much for listening and I really hope you enjoy our film, A Place That Is New. So I'm here with the team from Trans in Trumpland, a four-part docu-series upcoming. Um, I'm really excited to be sitting down with you all. Um, I think the project's a really powerful portrayal of the experiences of four transgender people living in politically hostile states that um, it's really timely right now. And so I'm really excited to be here with, with Tony, the director, Jamie, the producer, and two of the film's um, subjects. Um, so I think before we, we take a look or to begin, I definitely want to uh, give you each an opportunity to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your role with the project. Hi, I'm Tony Zasharafatan. I know it's a really long uh, last name, so you can just say Tony or Tony Z. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I am the director of Trans and Trump Land. Hi, my name is Rebecca, and I am one of the subjects for Trans and Trump Land. I live in the conservative state of Texas, and I play a big part of this docuseries, not only as being trans, but as being as an undocumented immigrant living in the conservative state of Texas. Uh, hi, I'm Jamie DiNicola, he, him, his pronouns, and I'm the producer of Trans and Trump Land, and kind of was a wild ride getting this all together, but I'm so happy we're all here today to do this. Uh, I'm Ash, uh, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I am one of the subjects. I live in North Carolina. Great, well, so happy to have you all here with me today. Um, and again, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, before we take a sneak peek to the project, which is, you know, some of the film skills all shot together. Um, you know, give you a little bit more about the project and how you came to be a part of the project. Uh, 
just to put images into some context before we start. Um, so yeah, um, the origins of the film um, are kind of unfortunately rooted in uh, the first week after Trump's win. Um, I like many Americans was very shocked. I was almost at a loss for words. And so the week after he won in, t in 2016, um, the title Trans and Trump Land just popped into my head out of nowhere. And um, I thought to myself, I have to run with this idea of traveling to conservative states that have anti-trans policies to see um, how the Trump presidency is going to affect the trans community because that same week, uh, Trump already eradicated, uh, he actually removed any mentions of LGBTQ rights on the White, White House website. Um, so I had a, a feeling that that wasn't going to be the first action that he took against the trans and queer community. Um, so the origin of the film, uh, it is rooted in a little bit of like fear, uh, injustice, definitely. Um, it has its origins in 2016. Um, so it's literally been in development since uh, for the past four years. Um, and I think as uh, the documentary has evolved, it's evolved in time with uh, Trump's attacks um, on the trans community, including his attempt to try and erase uh, trans people in federal civil rights protections. Um, so for me, I had to, I kind of um, wanted to use like my background in film to kind of both educate and entertain um, Americans. So the docuseries, it'll educate people, especially people that are more trans one-on-one and might not know someone trans, but also it's a very um, lively documentary. It's very entertaining. Um, each of the four characters are like all very interesting people um, who are working on the ground in their states or they are, um, you know, affected directly by uh, an anti-trans policy. So to me, it's like, um, it's a documentary that I think is gonna, it's, it's not focused on trans tropes. It is about like showing trans joy, even in the most hostile states. And uh, Jamie, do you wanna add in your role as producer? Sure. Um, so yeah, Tony kind of, with the idea in like 2016 and I was super excited about how are we going to pull this off. Um, Tony was like able to find, you know, four amazing people in four really politically hostile states, like you mentioned. Um, we were lucky enough to become Rebecca and Shane and Yvonne um, and they graciously like let us into their lives in a really intimate a uh, really unique way, I think. Um, and I think because we are like trans filmmakers, we're able to have like trust established with our characters. I think a lot of filmmakers um, don't have access to. Um, so I'll let kind of Rebecca and Ash speak for themselves about what the process was like, but I'm just really excited to be able to share this with the world um, really soon. Hello, like I mentioned before, my name is Rebecca and I live in Texas. This project started off in my part as being a character. Tony reached out to me at that time. It was about two, three years ago. He reached out to me. At that time, I was working for a nonprofit organization for the trans Latina community here in Texas. And he reached out to me and he spoke to me about a little bit about what his project was going to be, what he was looking for. And I opened up to him and told him my story. Um, I was very grateful that he chose me because I am an a Latina immigrant living in Texas, and I fought my way within the immigration system to become legally in the United States, not only for the trans community, but as the Latino community, being double, um, I can say, being targeted, not only for being trans, but also being an immigrant. And um, I really like the story behind it. I really like what Tony was trying to focus on, you know, this administration and what they were trying, they were targeting the LGBT community, the Latino community. So I opened up to him. We started with a small docuseries called Rebecca. And that's where, like, we started raising funds for this film. And it was a big hit. There was a big hit. There was a lot of good commentary, bad commentary. And I really enjoyed it. I really loved it. And we moved on and we moved forward to actually making it into a big film. So I'm very grateful that Tony 
approached me and he really liked my story because it has not just a little bit of the trans community, but also his attack towards the Latino community as well. Um, I uh, heard about, um, when, when I heard about the project, I thought that it was really important. And um, I, uh, I, I wanted to be a part of it because of uh, how, how um, uh, uh, influential and uh, important uh, this type of media is for uh, like young trans kids and people who like are, are uh, around trans people to like um, uh, get some representation and to and to like uh, see the kind of things that we experience. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I think it's, it is a really timely piece. It's a really timely um, project. And um, I think you each are really, um, you know, I think trans people are super resilient. And uh, I'm, I think you're all super um, inspiring to be sharing your stories in this way and to be, to be um, putting this story out there so that that we, those of us who live in our own little bubbles, right? I'm, I live in Los Angeles. I don't, I don't know what it's like to be in the, at the center of, if, of Trump land, right? Like, I don't, I don't know what that, what that, what that's like, but, you know, you're still my trans siblings and I still want to know what I can do, right? Um, the, the theme of this summit is liberation. I want to know what I can do as a trans person in Los Angeles to help liberate my community everywhere. So I think this project's really powerful, not just for the trans community, but also for all of our allies out there. Um, and i um, really excited uh, to have you all here again. And um, I'm gonna open up the, the stills that, you are, that you've all prepared for us today. Um, and excited to kind of talk through them and, and take, a, take a little bit of a look into the, into the project. And that's our character named um, Shane, Shane Ortega, who is a, a disabled um, veteran and also identifies as Two-Spirit. That was on the uh, reservation there in uh, Pocatello. And um, it actually occurred during one of my favorite moments of filming, which was a Sundance that Shane participated in along with his community there. Um, I just love the way in which we captured his joy in being part of that community and his chosen family there. And um, yeah, so we uh, decided to uh, have Shane um, be part of this like portrait moment right after the Sundance. So uh, my camera guy and I captured that together. And um, I just think it speaks to Shane's resilience, his um, like deep spirituality, his native roots. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of that portrait. I think it's one of my favorite from the film. Yeah. Yes to all of that. <laughs> um, do you want me to take this one, Tony, or you want to get this one? Cool. Um, so this was actually on a Fort Hall reservation, which we were like lucky enough to be able to film on, which I think is really like powerful and sacred. And um, we didn't take that lightly. Um, and this is actually a shot from when um, Shane was showing Tony around the reservation. And there's like a buffalo sort of like haven on the reservation there. And uh, Shane was explaining to us about the sacredness of the buffalo in relation to his tribe. Um, so that was when uh, Shane was preparing his um, regalia for an upcoming Sundance in California. After we were done shooting, he informed us that it was a Sundance that only two spirit people are invited to. Um, so he was doing some beading and, and knitting and that was at his home. So I really enjoyed that because it was like verite in the moment. And um, we were just really happy that we got to share that like intimate uh, space at, at Shane's house and get to kind of witness how he prepares for Sundance. I'll let you take this one, Tony, since this is you. That, that's a, um, yeah, that still is, uh, kind of captures the essence of the road trip theme of the documentary series. Um, so that is uh, 
my sedan that I was driving around the country and we tried to get a red sedan in all four states just to keep going with that theme which kind of plays on uh, the red states that we're in um, and so I, I love color symbolism as a director so I was like we have to keep the red the red car so that's a still of me uh, driving um, and it looks like it was captured with a drone yeah that looks like a drone shot so that was in Idaho as well of um, the sedan that we we had in all the four states. Um, I really love this picture. This picture really shows a lot because we went actually went to the border and film on the border wall, and it shows the separation. It shows you know this is a symbol of hatred right there that really really hits my home because. It's so close to where my family's at and it, you know, represents nothing by hatred, separation of families, you know, and um, when we went down there to the border wall, like we actually, there's a section of the border wall where we actually cross from one side to the other with any difficulty. So like it represents and it shows how our system is so broken, like right there, like it sh actually shows you're trying to make a barrier to stop immigration coming into the United States, but yet it's not structurally correctly done that you can easily cross it from one side to another. And um, it's just like, I was just looking over the other side and it, it, it really just shows, you know, the whole symbolism of separation of families and on the border. Do you want me to take this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take this one. Okay. This one, this one's actually at the flea market. We went to the flea market, which is basically for the trans community in Houston. It's a place where we gather. It's a safe heaven for us, where even though we live in different sections of Houston, Texas, we still have a place where we go and gather together and, you know, talk about different things. You know, every Sunday they have, like, live music we actually had our uh blue corn quesadillas which tony really loved it's a part a segment of the of the film where we're actually conversating and eating and talking about the whole you know representation of the latino community in houston texas where we still have a place where we gather and we don't have to worry about our surroundings or surroundings or what's going on in the world we still have our community gathered together and the trans community gathers together even though we live in different areas. We have a place where we get together and enjoy ourselves and have a good time. That's right outside my brother's house. <laughs> this is like, this to me represents a symbol of family, you know, a symbol of love. I've always had the support of my family behind me. And um, it just shows where, how we united we are, even though my, my mom's very Christian and she's very uh, into church. She's at first had a hard time understanding, but she then, you know, was able to cope and understand, you know, that this is my life. This is who I am. And doesn't matter what, I'm still going to be her daughter no matter what. Even though that she has different religious beliefs, she's still there for me as my mother. Oh my God, this was our five o'clock, five in the morning sunrise. This was a crazy shot. Like, it shows a lot. It shows, you know, the beginning of life, the beginning of a day, you know, just walking barefooted on the sand and walking in the ocean as I, I'm walking away, trying to reach the sun. Like, this is a very emotional shot because it, shows you know how liberal and how easy it is to be anywhere and you know not to think about the hate not to think about anything just liberate your brain and move on again <laughs> okay this is part of me because i was detained in this facility it was very hard going to this facility and remembering all the details that went inside of this facility, it was, um, 
it was very hard because I was detained. I was mistreated, misgendered, and um, I was detained three different times and transferred into four different facilities. And one of the harshest facilities, it was right here where even the correctional officers do not have the education and do not properly, they're not properly trained to house trans, the trans community. And it was very difficult for them to understand what a trans person really was. And it paid a toll on me mentally and physically because um, I wasn't allowed of any of my hormone therapy. I wasn't allowed to, to be who I was. And it was really, really hard. This, this picture is very emotional because like I had all I had to go through to fight myself and finally got what I wanted. <laughs> That's my best friend, Becky. This picture, we actually took it apart. Um, we were walking, I think it was a, there was a police monument that we went to that I was overlooking the city. And it just, you know, we were just having a good time, enjoying each other, you know. This is my trans family, my chosen family, like we say. And I'm very grateful to have her as, as my friend. She's been there for me through thick and thin, and, and I'm very happy she's part of my, my trans family. Tony, you wanna get this one? Um, so that is uh, from our Mississippi episode, and um, that's Ivana, who runs the state's only trans-led nonprofit. She's the founder and CEO, and um, I, that's another memorable shoot. It was right in front of uh, a church in Natchez, Mississippi, and that is where um, Ivana's family is buried. Um, it even goes back to um, her, like, family slavery roots, like her uh, grandmother, who was a slave, uh, was buried there as well so when I shot there and just like for Ivana's story as well it really symbolizes like the ways in which her family has morphed over so uh, her um, maternal grandmother is buried there as well who is a major source of support for her as a trans woman and to me um, I think this like shot really captures like Ivana's strength um, her growth as a person, and really the ways in which uh, she stands tall for the trans community in Mississippi, being uh, one of the only leaders there. Uh, this is Jazz House slash restaurant, and Ivana kind of goes there on like a weekly basis to meet up with her friends. So you guys eat really good food there and listen to some really good music. Uh, so this was um, the name of the nonprofit is Love Me Unlimited for Life, and it provides vital, like not only healthcare support but housing support for um, the LGBTQ community in Mississippi, which is pretty violently neglected there. I'll let you get this one, Tony. Um, so that is uh, a still from uh, Ivana's favorite uh, salon in the Jackson area. Uh, the owner is like a cis woman and all the other uh, women there are cisgender, but like it was interesting to see how Ivana just kind of seamlessly is like integrated into this um, salon community there. And she goes there every week. It's like described as her form of self-care so she can wash all the stress of like the previous uh, week away. And um, I just found it really interesting how um, Ivana has formed her community outside of her family and friends there in Jackson. Um, so that's another reason why I love, I love this still. Uh, you, you, you take this one, Ash. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm not exactly sure what to say about it. Um, uh, I, I I think I I I think the the still captures like uh, a nice kind of peaceful focused moment, which um, I I think is uh, good and like 
kind of uh, uh, important also to like to just see like some some nice um, sort of like focused, peaceful, like um, kind of uh, strength almost. And yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, this still is uh, me at uh, Taekwondo um, sparring and Taekwondo is a really important part of my life because it gives me uh, confidence to uh, defend myself if the need arises, which I think is um, uh, unfortunately uh, kind of like a, a necessary thing for people in the, in the trans community is um, uh, uh, self-defense knowledge. And um, Taekwondo is also really important to me because of uh, the kind of like a uh, self-improvement that uh, comes with being a martial arts student and like uh, striving for um, uh, excellence in the field of like um, uh, like uh, using your body to uh, to defend yourself and um, it I, it's so it's that 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 is just a really important thing to me. Uh, I was um, writing in the still uh, in 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 the woods, uh, like on um, on the parkway in North Carolina, which is really beautiful. Um, so uh, yeah, I was just like writing in my journal. It was very like quiet and um, like uh, being out in nature, which uh, is is um, also uh, very very um, important to me, I think, is like um, uh, spending time outside and writing and like being exposed to the natural world. And, yeah. Um, in the shot, I'm playing Dungeons and Dragons with uh, my group of friends, which is uh, like uh, a huge part of my life is playing D&D. &D. Uh, it's, it, it really helped me come out actually uh, like getting to role play characters of uh, the gender that I see myself as was a really important step for me in in like figuring out my identity and coming out. So yeah, D D and D is like a, a very important part of my life. Yeah, well, um. these different where in the process I think to hear um, once it's out there sure I'm really happy with where the project's at uh, right now Editing all four episodes are at least at a row. Aim for picture lock in September, and uh, then it'll go into color correction and um, sound. Um, we're just yeah, I think like we're we're done all the. Um, we're just trying to hone in on all. We have like a three act structure, and um, we're t telling the um, um, and other than like editing and, and post, like an offer for have a release date set that'll be that news will be coming soon. So we're just so that the most um, viewers. You know, can access it across a bit, and um, I just hope for me as a director, I just want um, to help educate people, maybe to 
be part of this like continued um, progress in the, the film and media industry with telling and shying away from and so um, that's I just educate people at Uh, what we go through on a daily basis under the Trump administration. You know, streaming once all of them, you know, will. We're in a, the general election, um, and to begin with. Um, how will into the uh, into the narrative of the project that also fit it's um a little bit trump contingent so we're trying as action um and then you know say happening if we had to release the series. the result is so hopefully Trump uh, Biden wins uh, what do you call it? like an interest allow people to uh, reflect to the trans community and the effect that individual rights and our rights as a community like there's that possibility 11 how that wrong there um if trump there would probably be like a season um that would probably kind of follow up like four episodes or is that might be just about second term. Um, so that's what I could forward and kind of with in each episode really like about Trump in a way, but in a lot of ways and the policies that you know have been around prior to his presidency. Um, and sort of the culture that he's bred, I don't see anywhere anytime soon, unfortunately. So sort of the issues that we've touched on, um, you know, immigration discrimination, like all of these things, general election outcome is. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with that. I don't. terms of you know revoking health care rights and higher he just bolstered them once he got um into the white house um so um, i guess my question is then goes to rebecca and about um you know How's the climate been like where you're at, right? In Texas and North Carolina. Um, different from 2016? And if so, how? Um, but yeah, just kind of wanting to hear like coping with all of this and kind of what's going on in those states.
pandemic. I mean, it's really not much going on and like we can um, I really liked since we started the DocuSeries our approach of, of more trans Latina community, you know, reaching out person, they see me as somebody that, you know, can actually scared to, you know, even open up or the Latino community and the whole discrimination with the trans community. Somebody that can, I can actually now speak out, you know, they, they, they saw a little how, you know, I'm not afraid, you know, no, no Um, they actually, you know, reach out to me and, you know, get advice on, you know, how can I going through immigration courts, you know, I'm going through, you know, being, as being trans, how can I, and you were able to, you know, get states and, um, it helped out a lot. It helped out a lot in, in a bit more of people are more open how they don't fear as much as they did before because, you know, they you know hey, can you help me out? Do you have allies that can help me out because of this situation, you know? And the whole administration has been attacked, especially in the immigration system. Every day you wake up with something different. Every day there's something different. Whole border. So a lot of the trans community who are trying of coming into the United States, they can't even apply for it right now. There's a lot of the trans community who are on the border right now. Sorry to be hurt and you know because they're running away from from you know even getting killed on their own in their own countries and right now all borders are closed. Nobody they're not asylum and every day with the immigration system there's something different. There's something they change Hard. It's kind of hard for this administration, and then on top, he's bringing in. You know, there's no more. Uh, he tried to eradicate us. You know, he tried to, and it's it's stressful in a way. But we know, as a community, we can overcome in front of us to um in uh there's not really a super hostile there's like this fear in the background all the time because there's definitely a, a potential for one like um current president has done to try and remove trans rights or allow people to discriminate and in more um more like liberal states for people um so there's there's definitely that like uh sense of uh fear that something like I'm 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 not at school, so there. When when I was at school in person, like out in the world more often and stuff, and stuff like that, because of the like huge stigma around like trans people and even since HB two.
um, that uh, energy here. Uh, so it, it, it feels dangerous to, to do. And yeah, there's just like this kind of Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, thank you both for kind of from your perspective where you're living. Um, I mean, as I said, you know, I'm in Los Angeles, and you know, like it, it catches you up here. Um, but kind of shifting gears a little bit of the summit. I wanted to kind of ask each of you to um, share feel like what does it look like like when when we talk I mean for you um, so as a trans man um, liberation to me looks like on an individual level, like having the rights that are afforded to uh, other cisgender people, like um, just learning about like Rebecca and Ashley, how different it is to be trans in all the 50 states. And I just don't think allowed to happen. I don't think that Americans should accept that as the normal. Um, so for me, like liberation looks like my full federal rights. Uh, what is trans health care and hormones. Um, it also means that I should be protected when I have a job. Um, it means that I don't want, you know, one out of three trans Americans. So liberation to me looks like, um, I think, full civil rights, uh, the ability to live our And um, as a filmmaker, it means that trans stories both in front of the camera and behind the camera. So I think it's, um, in that sense, like freedom. Yeah, for me, it's absolutely necessary. That's like the very um, And ways I think that liberation to me would look like this like a trans man like uh i would long for the day where i don't have to be an activist what true liberation looks like now in my it's very very emotional um deportation uh being a latina being in a facility where they're not properly trained properly and then on top of that to be um right away you know to be able to not have the freedom as a human being being detained on this ICE facilities, not it's very, very, very difficult and like trans what we want to focus on in the ICE detentions to be able to be out in the world and be free and be liberated, to be free, to have the same freedom as any other person. You're not, you're not, you're guilty. To, yeah. You've been guilty. So, you know, to be incarcerated on this facility, uh, properly trained on housing trans people, it's, it's very difficult and that's what we want to, because these people are running away, trying to get away from their countries where, you know, if we see ourselves here, 
there's no rights whatsoever. You know, you can get killed, you can get shot, and they'll just take it as, oh, it's just another homicide, you know? It's not an actual uh, uh, racial... And that's not right. That's not right. We are still human beings. We're still here, and we're going to be here. This the freedom and the ability to do everybody else should be targeted because you're a trans person. I think recently saying that it's fun to be trans because you have to, because you get to become an expert resistance to other people. And I think that um, uh, uh, like learn all of these like validate your existence to random people. For, for us to have the same rights that cis people do in terms of like healthcare, especially um, and accepted as like real human beings with want to, to like really any random person who who thinks that right just not want not having to do with liberation being tied to our our rights as on a personal level right liberation is this this quality of like being able to live your life without fear that that something's gonna that you're gonna lose your job or you're not gonna get health care or no one's gonna love you. you sharing that I know we're out of time so I just wanted to ask one final question how can folks support the project and what do you want people to take away um, for what is um, I, I think I you know I would love to hear what you all would, would want out of this? Um, I think the uh, ways in which people, uh, when we come out, uh, will be you know on some about us. Tell your family about us. Uh, review us. Um, you know, I that just helps us, you know, online. Um, if you're so inclined, if you want to support our post-production editing and um, color and sound budget, uh, you can donate on the trans private and secure donation link. And um, yeah, those would be the, the two ways, uh, ways in which you can support. And for me, just to show like we're we're tr we're here we're trans we're not um yeah to so, um as a producer and i deal with the budget and stuff oh i help it which is always kind of a big big number thing um and trans people you know we're a trans owned production company tony and i so Unfortunately, there's not a lot of trans people in the actual film industry. Often it's like, um, so I just want to really reiterate how important I think that that is. What people take away from the project is that, you know, regardless of the like legalese or um, sort of humanizing one. Um, so I think that if Way, I think that would make
I personally see it, um, what I want people to take from this is education more than anything. And for it to be an eye opener for individuals who, or cisgender individuals who don't have to go through what we go through every day, you know, try to prove our insistence, uh, prove or prove that we're here, you know, prove that who we are and we're not going to go anywhere, you know, just more than anything and for it to be an eye opener for the community out there that we exist and we're not going to go anywhere. We're still going to be here and we're going to be fighting. We're going to be moving forward and, you know, hopefully one day we don't have to be doing this. We don't have to be, like you said, we don't have to be active. We can live our lives on a day, daily basis without having to worry who's behind us. Um, I I really hope that uh, that this project can, uh, like you said, Rebecca, open a lot of people's eyes to the trans experience and um, maybe gain us some empathy from people who didn't really understand that as much before. Um, and also for, uh, for, for other trans people to see some representation and like to, to, to maybe see like someone who represents them, uh, which is not something that we get as much, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the, this project definitely has the, the, the power and the potential to accomplish all of those things. Um, and I'm really excited to when the news comes out to promote it and to get my family and friends and um, my colleagues at Outfest to also promote it once it comes out. Um, really appreciate you all taking the time, you know, to to share this little sneak peek into the project and kind of share your thoughts about, you know, um, share share your experience about putting this 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 project together. Yeah, if there's anything else you want to share, please do so now. Otherwise, thank you all so much and. Um, I, I look forward to uh, seeing the complete series. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. It's been really awesome. And it's like our first kind of like press thing together, so it's really cool. Yeah. All right. This is the first time uh, Rebecca and Ash are meeting, so that's awesome. <laughs> Give that to me. <laughs> All right. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. actor, musician, and performance artist. Liberation to me feels like a lotus floating in a body of water. And by that I mean the lotus or being gets to decide what that body of water is, embody what it feels like to be safe and feel at home in a body that is boundless, that is formless that is expansive just as their identity is. I think liberation means to live in a world where every being gets to vibrate at their highest frequencies and have all of the means to do so. Yeah. Hey Outfest, what's going on y'all? Uh, my name's Toby, I'm an anti-disciplinary artist, I'm a community organizer, a parent, and one third of Waste Woman. Um, liberation to me looks like everybody having a full understanding of whatever their definition of home is. And I look forward to a potential reality where that is actually the truth. <laughs> I hope you enjoy the show. Hey, what's up, Outfest? This is Adi Damala. I'm one third of Waste Women. I'm also a poet, a barber, a drag performer, and a parent. I use drag to play with concepts of masculinity, femininity, gender, and desire. Liberation to me is access to good food, access to fresh water, and autonomy over your existence and your dreams. Enjoy the show.
drive myself crazy trying to bull on the budget Can't get no sleep, I work too hard No water in the tank, oh shit, my boat is sinking Would somebody snap me out of it? Would somebody snap me out of it? Would somebody, would somebody snap me out of it? Would somebody snap me out of it? Snap me out of it. Hey, did you breathe out today? Oh, hey, take some time out to play. guiding us Get and those that are protecting us of my
Oti oti wa. Schofield, and along with trans director Andrea James, trans producer Calpurnia Adams, and an entire team of trans, non-binary, cis women, and people of color, I created the project Becoming a Man in 127 Easy Steps, which is a multimedia pick-your-path experience uh, through 127 different short pieces that are in film, uh, text, and audio. Uh, I'm super grateful that Outfest uh, programmed this project, uh, and I hope that you enjoy it. Thanks very much for having me. First of all, I am a feminist. Second of all, I spent a lot of my life living as a woman, so I know the rules, and I'm not about to go breaking them just because I became a man and the whole world told me I could. So I make sure to ask and listen for enthusiastic consent at every move. This is what that looks like. Can I kiss you? Yeah. Can I touch your
your breast. Uh huh. Can I touch your other breast? Okay, you need to stop that shit. You could do whatever the fuck you want. Which I'd say is both enthusiastic and consent. And a method that gets you laid 100% of the time, in my experience. Hey Scott, it's Pat Greeny. How you doing? I just got your message about um, you don't know how to be a man in 127 even steps. And part of the process of making the piece is where you are now, and that's why it will be great. You don't have to be whatever your ideal is of a man in order to write about it. The whole process that's so amazing is that you're going through what you're going through, and that needs to be part of your piece. And I think it's great. It's scary. I mean, just even what you said, if you saved that phone message, it's like, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know how to be a man, I don't know how to... Of course not, because you're in the process of transition, and you always will be. It's not going to change. <laughs> so you're always going to be transitioning into something. So um, I just want you to know that I, I, was, I just gave it some thought, and I just got out of therapy, so I feel fairly well-balanced. And uh, that is should be in your piece, and how you freak out about it, how you think... You have to be something when there's nothing to be because the idea of being a man is just an idea and there's a platonic idea with something and then there's the experience which is ever-changing and it's a process of evolution which is what's so beautiful about any transition. So that's all I got to say, bro. Call you later. Bye. Step 126, take several seats. I am well aware of how very much I am talking here and that I am now a white man doing it. I am also aware of the fact that there are many other people and experiences that deserve your time and attention too. I would like to think that my being a transgender man Taking up all the space of 127 stories means something good about representation and self-esteem and making a mark in history against the forces of erasure. But there's this nasty voice in my head whispering, mansplaining, and taking up too much space. This is my life's work. From being a visibly trans kid, to transitioning with an audience, to being an out trans adult, when I dissociate in a moment of dysphoria, my reflex has mercifully been to view the moment as a story, to focus on the details, find the meaning. Being visibly trans wasn't always something I could avoid, so I featured it because it made me safe and strong. Now, when I can move through the world as just a guy, Staying out as trans means not losing everything that brought me here. Because in becoming a man, I have lost the nuances of my actually non-binary gender identity. In becoming a trans man who married a cis woman, I have lost being acknowledged as queer. Becoming myself has meant losing myself over and over again. And of course, then, there's the loss of all the trans people we lose to murder and suicide every day, which hasn't even merited interest enough from mainstream audiences to lose. Sometimes it feels like being trans is in itself a state of constant loss. Telling trans stories, my stories, fills in the loss with realness and love that can never be lost. And again, Telling my own story means centering myself. Right now, in the middle of 2020, I am not sure if that is the right thing to be doing, even with all of the right reasons that I have to be doing it. I've come all these 127 steps and it is no longer the victory I thought it would be. It's hard to hold that as a trans person who struggles with self-worth because I am trans. Because I am trans, I know I am more than just a man. 
because I grew up from birth in an interracial family, I know I am more than just white, too. But it is not enough to know those things. It's not even enough to say those things. This is a time to take action. In my daily life, I am taking the action and the step of taking a seat as a white person, not participating in white supremacy by pulling back on my self supremacy. But this work had momentum and a contract already and the show must go on. The show that we know was rigged to favor white people in a moment when the show has only barely begun to authentically include trans masculine folks at all. How much did my talent earn me this platform and how much of it is bias? It's like the opposite of the question that follows me around every time I don't get included, wondering whether it was because I'm trans. They're both real questions based in real dynamics. It is possible to be put ahead by my white passing masculinity and to be held back by being openly trans at the same time. That's literally the struggle. Well, my struggle anyway. And they are also both self-negating binaries that only allow for silence. Silencing or being silenced, sometimes simultaneously, which just leaves silence. I do not know what the answer is and I do not want to take up more time explaining it. Simply put, <clears throat> my story may be important and it may not be as important as I believe it is. Writing both of those sentences is one step I can take toward being the kind of white man I want to be. And finally, forgive me, I am a white man. I can't help myself. Look, I don't know if it is, but I hope it is clear that these stories are just mine and I do not tell them to represent much less silence anybody else. I don't know if you will, but I hope you understand that the project of these 127 steps is to demonstrate the value of trans stories and to encourage you to take and tell at least 127 of your own steps too. I don't know if you believe it, but in the march to liberation that I am on with you, there are endless steps and space enough for every body and time for every story to be heard. I don't know if I'm doing it right, but that is the world I am marching toward. One man in a crowd getting larger with every step we all commit to take. New story.
So sorry about technical difficulty for this panel. We'll be airing it at a different time. I'm going to go ahead and leave you with an with an outro. Um, so um, thank you for tuning in, and um, yeah. Thank you for joining us for the fourth annual Outfest Trans and Non-Binary Summit. I hope that after listening to all of these amazing artists share their work with you, share their stories, and share their experiences, that you're able to take their words and reflect on what liberation is to you. In the fight for liberation, it is important for us to invest in our communities. Thus, I encourage you to donate to the organizations listed here and to all of the artists who shared with us today. That information is listed here. I also want to thank Outfest for giving us this platform and for instilling in me the confidence to put together this program. I want to also encourage you to please give back to Outfest as well. They're at the forefront of giving LGBTQ storytellers a platform and helping them reach larger audiences such as yourself. Lastly, I want to thank all of the artists today who shared with me, who shared with us, their vision on liberation who shared their work with us and their experiences. Thank you all for coming together and making this an amazing program for our community. With that said, I'll see you all next year. Bye.